Hi, I'm Mei Farid. Hi, I'm Hui Li. So hi, Hui. We uh, recently had a paper published in the journal Regulation and Governance. And in that paper, we looked at how international NGOs operating in China respond to the overseas NGO management law and related institutional pressures. Can you share with us a bit of background about that paper? Sure, let me share the screen first. Okay, so we know that international NGOs have played an important role in global governance, helping to spread liberal norms, encourage democratization, and foster development. However, globally, we have seen that an increasing number of regimes, uh, such as India, Russia, Egypt, have passed more restrictive NGO laws. And the space for civil society and NGOs is constricted. Um, so take China, for example. In 2016, the government passed the law on the administration of overseas NGOs in China. The law requires that INGOs must find a professional supervisory agency as the first step of their legal registration. Um, the law also shifts the registration and the supervision of INGO's work from the Ministry of Civil Affairs to the Ministry of Public Security. Uh, so there was a major shift in the environment of INGO's. And the interesting thing is that um, these INGO's responded very differently to the law. So we want you to understand two things. First, how do INGOs respond to this changing political environment? Second, how do we explain the variation in their responses? So to answer these questions, we conducted 33 in-depth interviews with INGO executives, domestic NGOs in China, with scholars and also with government officials. Our sample includes 21 distinct INGOs, which vary in several different respects, such as country of origin, field of work, size and experience in China. We identified four major strate strategic adaptations that INGOs have made and put them on a continuum. On the left-hand side is exit, which shows the least compliance to the law. And on the right hand side, you see legal registration, which represents the highest level of compliance. In between, you have INGOs that choose to localize or to pursue provisional strategies. Most INGOs choose to let legally register in China. They usually have to go through a lengthy process to do this, which involves finding the right government department to serve as their professional, professional supervisory agency build trust with that department, and also communicate frequently with the Public Security Bureau. Some NGOs uh, adopt provisional strategies, such as maintaining a base overseas, uh, such as in Hong Kong, for example, and then filing for temporary activities through working with Chinese partners. This kind of strategy is often temporary and can be quite costly. Other NGOs INGOs chose to register new local institutions in China. This can be helpful in terms of domestic fundraising, stability, and local ownership, but it can be risky because it does resemble building a shadow entity. A few INGOs chose to exit for various reasons, and for many of these, it's among the most difficult decisions they've had to make. Um, so we were very interested in why INGOs chose very different strategies, despite the same INGO law and the changing political environment. So we developed the concept of INGO adaptive capacity and argue that it's a strong predictor of organizational responses to the changing um, political environment and institutional pressures. Uh, specifically, adaptive capacity can be shaped by four factors. Issue sensitivity, value add, government ties, and the reputational authority. Uh, issue sensitivity captures the sensitivity and approach of the issues that INGOs work on. 
and suggests that authoritarian governance of INGOs involves promoting issues and approaches conducive to the regime and suppressing those that deemed hostile to the regime. A value add touches upon INGOs' varied contributions to the state and reveals that INGOs that are better at positioning in authoritarian regimes have a higher chance to thrive. Government ties highlights INGOs' multiple embeddedness with the state and suggests that uh, an illiberal corporatist approach to state society relations in China. Uh, lastly, reputational authority underlines INGOs' linkages to the broader audience and indicates that INGOs can leverage support from other stakeholders, such as uh, social media and headquarter government, to strengthen their capacity in authoritarian regimes. So building on the concepts discussed here, we formulate an integrated framework of INGO strategic responses. The institutional pressures strategic response link is affected by INGO adaptive capacity. And this is jointly shaped by INGO's issue sensitivity, value add, government ties, and reputational authority. Overall, we believe that INGO's varying responses to the INGO law and the broader political environment may eventually serve to reshape China's NGO landscape and civil society. Our findings and framework have relevance to other authoritarian regimes or to democratic states that, that adopt authoritarian practices, which are subject to increasingly stringent regulations and a closing political environment.